Anin, Buzu, Tanya Talaga, Nagish Nakas. My name is Tanya Talaga. I am a journalist and I am an author. I can talk to you quite a bit about disruption. I actually just got finished disrupting the Massey lectures. Um, <laughs> and those of you who are on the journey with me know what that's all about. Um, we quote unquote indigenize the Massey lectures. It is a bit of a different Massey lectures this year. If you saw us across Canada, you'll know of what I speak. And if not, you'll be hearing about it next week, hopefully as they begin to be broadcast on Monday night. But tonight, I am going to tell you one story, and I'm going to focus on one aspect of disruption, and that is about a law that has been on the books in Canada since 1876, and that law is called the Indian Act. The Act was created to isolate Indigenous peoples on remote reservations and to keep them subservient to Ottawa for more than 100 years also kept them out of the way of settlers as they went across Canada and settled this nation. The Indian Act has been described as a form of apartheid, a piece of legislation designed to control and tame the indigenous population. The Act historically outlined every aspect of life for an indigenous person in Canada. It was through the Act that the Canadian government formed policy surrounding residential schools placed bans on religious ceremonies, restricted access to courts, limited movements by First Nations people off the reserve without permission from the Indian agent. It also did not allow political organization. To this day, it dictates the terms of who is considered a real Indian under federal statute and hence who receives treaty rights. And so it's keeping all of those things in mind that I talked to you tonight about an event that I was at in May of this year. It was a remarkable event, and it was called Determination. And it began for me as I descended the elevator at the Delta Hotel in Ottawa, and the doors opened up, and I heard the strong, loud pulse of the drum, and it beat in perfect time like the steady thumping of the human heart. And it filled the lobby of the hotel, which is located on the unceded territory of the Algonquins, whose land the Parliament of Canada sits on. It is unceded because this land was not surrendered or given away. It is still the subject of treaty negotiations with the government of Canada, the province of Ontario, and the Crown. On May 23rd, 2018, a First Nations-led conference was called Determination. We held it there. And it was about moving beyond the Indian Act. The airy, light-filled lobby smelled of sweet smoke. A smudge ceremony was taking place in the grand ballroom. It was where we were all meeting. The conference was organized by the Grand Chief of Nishnabi Aski Nation, Alvin Fiddler. And he brought together an impressive list of close to 300 First Nations elders, leaders, knowledge keepers, youth, authors, lawyers, for two, day, for two days at the conference. We were all there just to imagine a future without the Indian Act. Many respected people were there. Lawyer Bev Jacobs, one of the first presidents of the Native Women's Association of Canada, Ovid Merkady, former chief of the National Assembly of First Nations, youth leader Max Feinday, a number of grand chiefs representing everyone from BC all the way through Ontario. And the conference was also hosted by Osgoode Law School. You know, everyone there, everyone that we spoke to everyone in those grand ballrooms, we were all in agreement. Indigenous self-government must not be dictated by the federal government any longer, it must not be dictated by the Indian Act. Communities and nations should no longer be forced to abandon their culture and their spiritual practices, assimilate into the dominant society, adhere to federal governance of reserves, and have to register to be considered real Indians by the law in order to receive their treaty rights. 
communities and nations must be empowered to design their own path forward. NAN Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler walked up to the podium and he gave the opening address. If you don't know Alvin, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about him. Alvin led the push for the joint inquest, looking into the circumstances surrounding the deaths of seven Anishinaabe Asking Nation youth attending high school in Thunder Bay from 2000 to 2011. He served on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as manager of regional and Ontario liaisons. He was in charge of collecting testimony of residential school survivors. And now Alvin, actually today as we speak, he's in Banff right now, and he is talking about taking steps to decolonize the health system in Northern Ontario so funding and decision-making power is actually put in the hands of First Nations communities and not dictated by the federal government. In his opening statement at determination, Alvin told a quiet audience that he no longer wanted to be identified by a 10-digit government given to him by the federal government. He said, I took my card out the other day and I looked at it and realized it had expired about four years ago. That must mean I'm an expired Indian. The audience laughed. But he continued to talk about the current imperative that another generation of First Nations children not have to grow up under the shadow of the Indian Act. As a father of two daughters, he wants to, he wants to live to see the day when their existence is no longer legitimized by assigned numbers or dictated by the federal government, effectively making them wards of the state. Alvin believes it is not up to the government to determine who is Indigenous and who is not. Belonging is not theirs to give. <clears throat> 